Hey everybody, welcome to the first day of May. I hope y'all are having a good, good start to the month. I know uh, I'm having a great day. And Steve, you're back in Arizona. When did you get back in town? We got back in yesterday afternoon from Minneapolis, St. Paul. It was a good clinic out, or it was a good expo out there. You had been texting me some photos and you said, this is just awesome. The people, the management does a great job. You want to share just a little bit about the clinic and who you met and what happened out there? It was absolutely incredible. It was like it was like the 1800s walking down the street. No vehicles are allowed. People riding their horses up and down the roadway. There's wagons that with free wagon rides, great big beautiful teams of Belgians, of Percherons. Uh, they had demonstrations of six ups. It was absolutely incredible. Food, I mean, this wasn't the average fair food. This was some awesome food around that place. And vendors, I have never seen so many vendors. And all the vendors that I talked to, they were just ecstatic. They just loved this expo. And it was extremely well run. That's awesome. Was this the first year that you had gone? Yes. Yeah, I was supposed to have gone last year. But I had that hip problem, and uh, yeah. so I went this year. And since then, I've had some people from Wisconsin that came to the clinic and came to my expo. I had people come from Ontario, North Dakota, South Dakota, Indiana. I was amazed they come from everywhere. It was awesome, you know. That's but anyway, great. I had some people from Wisconsin. I've been trying to get in the Wisconsin show, yeah. and they said this show – at the uh, for the for the Minnesota Horse Fair is small compared to that one, and I can't imagine that. You know? Yeah. But anyway, well, the pictures that you were awesome sending were show. awesome. Absolutely were... incredible. Yeah, that's great. Well, we've got some great folks who are joining us today. We got Tracy Foley. We have Jason Brown, uh, Eileen Easterday, uh, Yolanda, um, Gloria uh, Meyer, uh, Linda, Jana. <laughs> we've got. We've got all the crew here, and we're ready for uh, we're ready for another live stream. Before we get into it, um, there's one thing that I know is important to you, just uh, regarding a friend and a prayer request. So why don't you go ahead and share? Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I I just got some really bad news this morning. A very good friend of mine, Nathan Medcalf, and he ran the Arizona show. Was coming back from Missouri from a, a big trail riding. Uh, uh, pl program that they were doing there and just outside of pace in arizona somebody hit them with head-on collision and it tore the trailer clean off of the truck just destroyed it hit him behind the back door both nathan and his wife are fine but they lost two mules and a dog and the other mule is right now with the veterinarian not sure how it's going to go but Folks, we need to be praying for Nathan and his family. They've it's this when you see the pictures on Facebook and this sort of thing, and I've sent some today. It's horrible. They need us to lift them up in prayer. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got the picture. I've got one of the pictures up right now. I've have. Uh, let me bring up this other picture. I've got the uh, the second one that you had sent me as well. Let me bring that up, so folks can just see. Yeah, so there's uh, we've got one here showing the truck, and then we have another one just showing kind of the aftermath a little bit there. Um, so yeah, it's one of those deals where we have a, a great opportunity just as a community, as a as a, a group of people who are um, you know bound together by similar interests to lift one another up in prayer and and uh, yeah. and have uh, have the Holy Spirit go go forward and and take care of the work that needs to be taken care of. So I appreciate you sharing that and. Uh, and we yeah. sure will be in prayer. Um, so, uh, so as we get going, I just want to remind people that uh, that we are here every single week for you. Um, our questions all come one hundred percent from uh, from you guys. So, if you have any questions that you want to ask throughout the entire broadcast, feel free to put them in the comment section. We give priority to live questions. And there's one area that I really do want to ask your um, ask your help with, and that is. Um, that is making sure that people in your circle, uh, the equine and donkey folks in your circle, that they know that we're doing this. Um, over the course of the last several months, 
um, we've grown, but we've kind of plateaued a little bit with the amount of people who are joining us live and then the amount of people who are watching the replay. And, and that's okay, but the, the thing that is really unique about these is we wind up uh, attacking a lot of the same subjects multiple times. And we just want to make sure that folks out there who have frustration, folks who are in the place where you used to be in so many different areas, we want to make sure that those folks know that the same resources that were available to you, the same um, you know, access to Steve and, and his experience that were available to you, that those same things are available to them. So two things you can do. One, you can share this with uh, your page on Facebook. And two, if you want to tag anybody in the comment section below, that's, that is one of the best ways to get people to be able to pay attention and say, oh, hey, what's going on over here? and get them to come in and uh, two things are going to happen. Number one, we are going to have a stronger mule and donkey community. And number two, we're going to get a great batch of new questions coming in as folks from different parts of the world begin to, you know, kind of say, hey, you know, I, I didn't know that this was here. I got some questions I want to ask too. So with that, the first question that I do have comes from Tracy. She was our first comment, at least the first comment I can see here. And uh, she says, hello, Steve, thanks for another great lesson. What type of halter do you rec recommend for trailering a mule? And I think that's a great question. It's one that we haven't had before. And uh, how about it, Steve? What type of halter do you recommend for trailering a mule? I won't use any other halter any other time except for a rope halter, period. I know there's a lot of controversy from people and they say, well, oh golly, yeah. Uh, you know, the rope halter could hurt them and this sort of thing. Uh, they haven't seen some of the accidents that I've seen uh, and rope uh, burns and this sort of thing. I actually, personally, I don't tie my mules inside the trailer. Uh, I've seen way too many accidents, uh, been in the middle of some as well. I've seen some people getting hurt because they their horse is pulling back and they feel like he's going to get himself in a jam. And they run in there to help him, and they end up going out on a helicopter. So I use rope halters all the time. Uh, my big thing is respect for the halter. And here's the downside. When they're in a nylon halter, they can set back and brace. They end up pulling. They end up pawing and this sort of thing. And uh, so I, I pretty much have stayed away from you nylon halters for the best part of 25 years now. Uh, Again, I don't tie my animals in the trailer. So, and I've traveled all over the United States uh, hauling mules in a three horse slant. And then I've also gone all over the United States uh, pulling mules, going hunting in Montana and Idaho. And, and uh, I've, uh, I've been all over with them, but I, I don't tie my mules. And like, for instance, if we're gonna go out and work cattle in a particular area and it's really tough, I just turn my mules loose in the in the uh, trailer they're fully saddled their bridle is hanging on the horn and tied and they they able to brace themselves they're able to brace themselves and do just fine and when we get to where we're going to get and folks these aren't paved roads that i'm driving on these roads are tough roads um uh, four-wheel drive roads we have to lock and four-wheel drive going up steep hills with four-wheel drive and this sort of thing and they're tough and, you know, I've, I have not had any of my mules hurt since I quit tying them in a trailer. That's good to know. And, um, and, uh, hopefully that gives, uh, Tracy exactly what she's looking for. Um, I know that, uh, there's lots of different people who have all sorts of different approaches and thoughts. And one of the things that I know you've said over and over again is, Hey, I'm just going to tell you what I've learned. I'm just going to tell you what I know. And if it's a fit for you, if it works for you, go with it. And if you want to try something else, you're free to go with that too. So um, hopefully, Tracy, that gives you some clarity on what you need to know there. Yeah, Steve. I might also mention too, folks, uh, there ain't nothing like a good sharp knife. You know, you don't want to try to untie something when it's in a fight uh, in this, or you know, just cut the darn halter and, and, and get that done. I, I've seen a couple different people stomped into the ground uh, matter of fact, I'm doing an expert witnessing case right now on one where the lady was really stomped in the ground and had to have the helicopter out because she went in to try to save her mule that she thought was in trouble that was pulling back. If she had had a pocket knife that was good and sharp and serrated, 
she could have reached in there and cut that rope and been done with it. Yeah. Uh, we have a follow-up question then um, from uh, Jana Schmidt. Um, she says, uh, do you have dividers in your trailer or is it a stock cattle trailer? I actually, when I was traveling in the United States, I had uh, dividers. Uh, when I, uh, when I, and when I'm working on the ranch and I got four wheel drive roads and stuff, uh, there's not dividers. And then, uh, and I can, I put as much as six meals in there at a time. Uh, I do have one divider that, uh, let's like say if I get a cow in there that I need to work a cow, then I'll put a couple cows in the front and I'll put a center divider and then I'll jump two mules in behind that. Dave, we used to just jump our, our mules in the back of a trailer, a back of a, tr a truck, in the bed of the truck, you know, and, and, and sometimes we had a rack and sometimes we didn't. But you'd see them going down the uh, two-tracker road with their ears flopping, <laughs> and we had masks on their faces mm -hmm. to keep the bugs from hitting. But uh, that's what we did. We sure did. So cro across country, it happened to be I had a three-horse slant, three-mule slant, uh, but I have gone clear up as far as Montana, all over New Mexico, Colorado, and this sort of thing with my gooseneck and loaded six mules in there, and it's an open stock trailer. So I've done both. So Kevin asks another follow-up question. He says, with everything that you're describing, uh, particularly with the halter, um, does that work with a mule that doesn't want to be in the trailer? Oh, absolutely. Here's the thing, folks. And I, and I, I, do, I talk about this all the time. It was my biggest Second biggest question at the expo this weekend, and that was halter communication and respect for the halter. Dave, we had a big old mule there that was dragging everybody everywhere. And I put that come along hitch on, mm -hmm. it was over with. Yeah. And I dragged the tarp and I flopped him with the tarp and everything else. But just respect for it. And there's the biggest problem that we have. In the trailer, when they pull back, if they feel the pressure of the rope halter and if we did our homework to start with as soon as they go to the right or go to the left or anything like that that halter is going to tell him that's a bad idea where the where the nylon halter that is a big web halter which by the way has steel uh, buckles on it that if you ever seen a couple of meals that i had where they were just hamburgered right here in the jaw because they would pull away and that steel from the rope halter just tore up their cheekbones. I mean, it was awful. I had to do stitching on two of two mules, but uh, I, I strictly, if you want to fix problems, adjust a rope halter correctly in the trailer, uh, vetting problems, everything. So what about a mule that doesn't want to be in the trailer? Uh, do you leave them untied in that trailer as you're going about? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. You're not yeah, concerned about feel... them getting nasty in there or anything? No. Never had it, Dave. Okay. Never had it. We've I've been I've been going up mountains in four wheel drive where I'm barely doing I mean steep mountains to get to a place. Uh, I've gone down steep mountains, of course, uh, muddy areas, and them mules just balance themselves out and stay in place. I've never opened a trailer and had a mule on the floor. Never happened. Matter of fact, now that I think about it. I haven't even had a horse on the floor when some of the cowboys uh, were riding horses and we stuck our horses in there. Never had a problem. They braced against each other. And when we load them, we load them nose to tail. Uh, but where the, what they really like to do, they really like to be turned around and look out for where they're going. They'll literally stand in the middle of the stock trailer and look and see where they're going. Awesome. So a uh, few more people have been uh, chiming in here. Jason says, new hat. Steve, why don't you tell us about the hat real quick, Steve? <laughs> this hat was made by Bear Hat Company. I had it made about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago when I was in uh, uh, Klamath Falls, Oregon. Awesome, awesome pack expo. And uh, it's a buckaroo hat. And uh, when you're in the, the Sierras, Montana and this sort of thing, you'll see a lot of buckaroos wear this type of a hat. Uh, the gray is usually the uh, the boss. The black is usually the cowboys, and the straw hats when you're hot, when it's too hot. <laughs> so you're getting ready to bust out your straw hats here for summer in Arizona. 
It's going to be 102 by Saturday, and right now it's 83. It's That's why I decided to come outside and let everybody enjoy the sunshine. Yeah, well, so actually, actually, it's, some of this is from the fire. There's a lot of smoke in the air and this sort of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, out here in Chandler, so we're about 45 minutes apart from one another. If I was to hop in my car and drive out there, it'd take me about 45 minutes to get to you. But out here right now, it's overcast and it's really nice. But when when I turned on when we turned on the Skype at the very beginning, um, you uh, you had the the background there, and immediately I thought, oh man, I wish I was out there. It's just so nice out there, especially yeah. on days like today. It's just uh, it's gorgeous. Hey, uh, Haley Williams uh, chiming in says, hey Steve. Uh, oh, Mark. So Mark is using Haley's account. Hey, Steve, this Hi. is Mark Williams from Chihaui, uh, Virginia. Just wanted to, you to know that it's about 70 degrees and sunny. And then uh, says, um, still riding your saddles I bought back in 09. That's got to be good to hear. Still as good as the day I bought them. Couldn't ask for a battle, better saddle. And by the way, I like your hat. <laughs> well, thank you. Mark, good, good to hear from you. I remember that guy. He's a bear hunter, this guy. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yes, sir. Very good. Well, you've got a. I think you have a bear skin. Don't don't you have a bear skin there in your uh, guest room, or at least you had it in there for a while? Yeah, it's in it's in the living room. There's a there's a uh, a three sixty two and seven eighths bull elk. Yeah. A bear and several deer, and this sort of thing. That's in one of the in the main main uh, living room. Yep. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Kay McGrady's watching from Sparta, North Carolina. Uh, Jackie and Greg Eden from Iowa. Uh, let's see here. Eileen says, is anyone else having trouble seeing the live stream? Eileen, I've got a version of the live stream on my computer down here and it's coming through fine. So if anybody ever has any problems with the live stream, what I recommend you do is if you're on the computer, close your browser and then open it back up. And if you're on your phone, go ahead, close the app, restart the app, not the phone, restart the app and then open it back up. And that usually solves problems I found. Uh, let's see here. Um, ma, 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 ma. Let's see. Uh, Ray Lockhart says, my mule leans on me when I try to exit my slant load trailer. Trailer, Any thoughts? Yeah, that's that's kind of what they do. One of the first things that I do when I start to exit is I take my uh, my thumb and I poke them in the ribs and I get them over so that they don't lean on you. They, they can be really bad about that. The other thing I have done is I have tapped them on the front, front uh, cannon bone with my uh, foot and that gets them out of the way but unfortunately they're really good about bracing and if they can think they can lean against you they they like to hold you in the trailer and they can brace against you <laughs> yeah yeah they do but like that's to do two that. things i would do you, got, you know just take your boot edge tap him on the can on the cannonball a pump cannon bone and then take your thumb and poke him in the ribs to get him over or take my pocket knife that I'm, i've been sending out to people and don't use the blade <laughs> just use the doll in and give them a little punch, and that works good. Uh, so uh, people are loving those knives. They are. Eileen, uh, Eileen uh, uh, placed an order about a week and a half ago, something like that, and she sent me a message. She says, "Hey, I, I, I got everything. Everything looks good. I just couldn't. See, I didn't see the knife, and I didn't see the uh, the saddle um, saddle fitting DVD." I said, "Oh man, we got to get that taken care of." And then I got a message yeah. back from her. Uh, I don't even think it was a day later. She says, "Oh." It was in some plastic. We're all good. I've got the knife. I've got the DVD. We're good to go. So I was glad. I was glad to hear that it was all there because because uh, yeah, those knives are pretty cool and uh, and they're they're yep. fun to have around. Let's see here, um, Yolanda. Right at the bat uh, at the top when Jason goes new hat, she goes it's a buckaroo. She's and then she goes once you start explaining, she goes I told you the buckaroo. Yeehaw! <laughs> all right, so the buckaroos they wear a lot of silver. And they wear chinks, and their their pants are down in their boots. That's how you know. That's how you know. There you go. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Lori Neely is. Uh, she says, "Hey, Steve." She says, uh, "Back in the day, you said Nicky'd be a good mule when he was ten. Well, he's been a good boy this whole past year, and is eleven, just getting better at almost twelve. Golly, you gotta love to hear that." <laughs> Lori, boy, she's quite a character. She's got this great little mule. Kind of a mind on his own, but so does Lori. And Lori don't take anything from him. She lines him right up. <laughs> That's good. Well, the next question that I had came in from a, uh, an email that was coming from Trish. Um, Trish says, and, and this is a this is a good question. How is it that you can tighten the back cinch on your mule 
and he's not going to go off bucking like a horse will be bucking. What do you uh, what do you say there? That the back D ring has a purpose, and that was the second most talked about problem there at Minnesota this weekend. That D ring is not at the area where they cinch him up for bucking. That area is right where the stomach and the hip come together. That's where they tie it off. Uh, and riding horses, when you're on a ranch, you come out here to the ranch, and, and the folks that are riding horses, they got their cinches right up tight. Here's the downside. When I ask for a show of hands, Dave, with the horses, mules, I said, how many of you have a bunch of white in behind the shoulder? And I'm going to tell you, easily 60% of the people throw their hands up. Yeah. And then when I took and I put the, the tree on the horse's back and showed them how the back of it stood up, and as they sit on it, it created all that problems, they restricted it. You know, and we love our horses, but we do silly things like don't use a rear cinch. That back D ring is there to balance the saddle. If you don't use that D ring on your horse, if you don't tighten it up on a mule, your saddle's going to cantilever, your mule's going to pay the price, and your horse will pay the price too. So that's a great question. Another question came in from John on Facebook, and his question was specifically about white hairs. And he said, Will white hairs show up? And show the same and, and mean the same thing on a horse as it does a mule. Of course, we talk about the white hairs coming from putting pressure on the scapula and scalding them and hurting them and things like that. Um, d is that the same case for a horse, or is is it different? No, absolutely, it's the same thing, <clears throat> David. It's, it's on a mule, especially if you tighten that down, you're really going to restrict that area. It's not so much that you're restricting the scapula, if you're, unless it's on top of it. But where it is restricting is the area in behind the scapula. And that's where you see all your dryness. That's where you see your white hairs. White hairs is a scald where we didn't lift up the back of the saddle and cool their, their back off. But white hairs is also from over tightening the front cinch. Look at it, folks. Watch your horse. Watch your mule. Watch them move across. As they move, you'll see that scapula on a horse going like this horizontally and what, what look right in behind there that big flat area you'll see it it's a working area and yet we when you put the your saddle on the back of that saddle stands up if you tighten that saddle and balance it you'll be just fine be you you won't have any problems awesome so next question that I have uh, comes in from Wayne on Facebook. And folks, if you need to get a hold of us, you can always send a, a message, an email to Steve directly, steve at muleranch.com. If you want it to come to me just to get it arranged for these uh, live streams, uh, you can send it to support at muleranch.com or you can just leave a comment or send us a message on Facebook. Just find some way to send a message. We get it. We get all of them that come through. And Wayne's from Facebook says, how old does a jack need to be before he starts breeding? I have one that's three years old and uh, been here since he was five months old. Never been around a Jenny, only mares. Still won't do anything. Is there anything I can do? Hmm. Well, if it, the, that's one of the main things is don't breed a Jenny. Uh, if you breed a Jenny and try to breed a horse, those donks don't usually go and try to breed uh, a, a mare. Uh, of course, surely he can see that both testicles are working. Uh, he may want to do a, a sperm test to see what's going on. Uh, when the when the mare is is showing heat, is he is he turning his upper lip up? Is he looking around? Also, has he make sure he's never been kicked? If he was kicked when he was younger then he'll, he'll not want to go near that mare, but uh, you have a problem. All right, very good. Um, so the next question that I have comes in from Jana. She says, general question. I have a donkey that wants to shy at everything. I correct him with the come-along rope and ensure he goes by the, goes by the monster. 
I'm concerned about how to handle the shine when he's in harness. Any ideas? Will this work out over time? Uh, what's your feeding program like? Uh, make sure you're not feeding the high carburetes, any grains or anything like that. That's super important. Uh, Why does that matter? Use, well, what matters is, the reason it matters is what happens with these donkeys uh, and, and horses and mules is those carbohydrates jack them up and they get really hyper. And then behind every corner, they're looking for a monster. And so that's why I suggest if people get a chance, they can watch my, see my video called, uh, no, my article called Mules Can't Stand Prosperity. And there you'll see about a, a mule that, uh, there's by the name of Norman and see how he changed all of a sudden became looking for monsters and, and how the feed changed his whole way of thinking. I'm adding that to the, uh, I'm adding that to the uh, the show notes right there so folks can get to that article. That's one that you send people to quite a bit is the Mules Can't Stand Prosperity, um, just quite frankly because it's it's that effective. And another thing that we have for people is uh, if they go to uh, muleranch.com slash feed um, or uh, feed talk, I'll put that in the comments too. Uh, there's a great, uh, I think it's close to a 30-minute conversation all about feed and nutrition, nutrition programs. Um, and it's got the, uh, the discussion on the lake and light, which is what you have used, um, in your feed programs, correct? Yeah, yeah, you bet. That's correct. Now, the other thing is, does she have blinders on her donkey when she's driving? Him? Did she start him with blinders or without blinders? The only reason I say that is so many people start their, their young donkeys and mules in harness and they use blinders, and you shouldn't do it. You should let them not have any blinders at all. Let them see a full 360, because those mules and donkeys, they can see the, the bottom of their back foot almost. Uh, they know exactly where everything is. Remember, they are a uh, animal that's being sought after to be eaten, you know. And being a prey animal, they need to be aware of 360, what's going on all the time. Don't ever think that that mule donkey don't know what's going on. They know what's going on around them all the time. And if they don't, they could be eaten really quick. So maybe she didn't, uh, maybe she's got blinders on them. She needs to take them off as well. Yeah, she does say still ground driving and yes, have blinders. Pull the blinders off. So why do why would people put blinders on in the first place? I, I've seen it. <laughs> I have no idea what they're for, why people would do that. What What is the... What is the common thought behind blinders or the reason or the time you would want to use it? I just don't know. Well, the blinders are shaped in, in a, a variety of shapes. It can be like this over top of the eyes, and that's called a pigeon wing. And then they can be half or a quarter on the side. And the purpose of them is so they can't see behind them. Can they be spooked? You bet. Loud noise goes off or some kind of noise and this sort of thing, they can still be boogered. But here's the thing. Uh, if you're if you're going to be showing according to show regulations, you've got to have blinders. But you're out there on everyday road, on back roads, uh, going up and down the road with vehicles and this sort of thing. Uh, I I've, I can tell you safely that on my mules, only time they had blinders on is when I went to the show ring. Other than that, they don't need them. Just the, they'll spook. Yep. Yeah. yeah, they, you know, a mule wants to know what's going on. They're at the bottom of the of the pecking order, right. of the food order, and and they just just for self uh, preservation, they 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 really want to know what's going on. They can see what's going on. You know, you don't have to all the time be talking to them. They've already heard you way before you walked up. You know, they know what's going on. Yeah, very good. Uh, next question that I have is, uh, it's all about uh, conditioning, and it comes from uh, Jermaine on Facebook. says, uh, in your last show, you spoke about spoke to a fit or well-conditioned mule being able to carry more of a load. Other than riding, what type of exercise for how long and how many times a week do you need to bring your mule up to condition? I currently work my mule four to five days a week. How long should I be doing this, one hour, two hour, more or less? Wow, good for you. Well, to build the hindquarters, you kind of need to also use a hot walker. But I mean, you can put them in a in a round pin and spend a half an hour or so with them. But 
the best thing you can do to leg them up is to ride them. You know, get out there, go up mountains, go down mountains. You're heading to Colorado and stuff. You need to put as much time on them as you can. Remember, folks, the biggest thing that you're looking at, ride them, pack them. Uh, you want to feel those tendons and make sure they're okay so you don't get a bowed tendon. There you go. Um, so the next question that I have has to do with uh, ring bone, and it comes from uh, Sandy on Facebook. She says, I want to ask Steve if he's ever had ring bone in a sound or it would not. So I was wondering if Steve had any history of something like this. This mule is only five years old. Oh, golly, I hate to see. That is, that is one of the downsides of, of the mules is the ring bone. I've not had any young ones. Uh, I've had a lot of animals brought to me to be trained on that's had partial uh, ring bone. I've done a variety of things uh, that are the old timer way. I've taken a heavy chain, a real heavy chain, and made it like a bracelet around the leg. And then as they walk with this chain, it breaks up the calcium deposits. Uh, I've put it on a few meals. I, I kind of thought maybe it worked good. But uh, ring bone is, is one of the killers of mules and donkeys. And uh, it, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, the hard ground that we're pounding on. So um, Gloria says, our mule Rosie has been worked in the MRM a couple of months. She started chewing on a bit really hard. She is allowed to pack it. I don't know if there's a, if there's a question there. Or if, uh, or if it's just kind of sharing a statement then, um, let's see. What is the MRM? I'm was questioning that myself. Yeah. What's an MRM? Yeah. Gloria, can you give a little bit of, uh, a little bit more explanation for us there on, on the, uh, the MRM? I've got a, I've got a comment here from, uh, Yolanda. She says, uh, I have a big problem. Uh, we wanted to sell the pony of my daughter two weeks ago. I uh, met the buyer for a ride in the woods. Everything was fine, but we came home. I unloaded the mule from the tra trailer, and the buyer unloaded Lucy from the trailer, but suddenly she slipped and fell down on her left knee and on the loading board, but landed with her right leg next to it and fell down very, very bad. Uh, one and a half mm -hmm. weeks later, the vet came for a health checkup and sale checkup, and she twisted the legs of this pony. The vet's here. Bend the legs to see the muscles are if their muscles are okay. Since that day, she can hardly walk, and uh, now a week later, it is getting worse. But Abby, she is like a real terror against all other horses to protect Lucy. And normal, she is acting normal, but the last day, she is very dangerous to other horses. And the problem is, we cannot separate her. Gloria just came back and said, "MRM is the Mule Riders Martingale." So she was given a oh. report. Uh, our mule Rosie has been worked in the mule riders martingale a couple months. She started chewing on the bit real hard. Uh, she is allowed to pack it. Good. All right. Good for you. Yay, Rosie. Yay, Rosie. There we go. Uh, so the next question that I have is uh, is just a pretty simple, straightforward question, and it's uh, about horses and mules. And it's just the idea of which one is stronger. Is a horse stronger than a mule or is a mule stronger than a horse, uh, carrying dead weight, uh, and packing versus riding. Would there be a difference in how much a mule could carry versus a horse? Well, pretty much the, the main thought over the years, and I've seen it time and time again is, yeah, that mule can out pull and out carry a horse any day. Uh, I've had some people tell me they, they believe a, a, a mule can pull twice of what a horse can. Uh, but we're talking pound for pound. So if we're looking at a 1,000-pound horse and 1,000-pound mule, not a 2,000-pound draft horse and a 1,000-pound mule. That's important. But uh, pretty much everything I've seen time and time again is I've packed horses back in to these mountains. And uh, when they come back out, they're all sucked up, shrunk up. Uh, they, they drop off weight really bad. And the mule, it looks like he goes in fat and comes out fatter. Very good. So a uh, Gloria just came back. She says, should Rosie be chewing the mule riders, Martingale a uh, bit so hard? Some of them do. Some of them will chew it and chew it and chew it. She's of course had her teeth floated. I hope, uh, make sure that the, uh, uh, the teeth are right and then go from there. Some animals just, 
just chew it. It just flat takes a while. They'll eventually get to where they can pack it. But uh, make sure that your teeth are floated. That's imperative. So the next question that I have, this one's from me, um, and it has to do with uh, with donkeys. First and foremost, I want to know up at the up at the expo in um, in Minnesota, were donkeys? I know mules are coming on, and I know donkeys are coming on. Um, we talk a lot about mules, but were donkeys well represented up there at the expo? Did you come across any donkey folks up? And everybody clapped their hands, and her and the mule went off skiing. She, the mule was literally dragging her. So that was my first thing I did, or the donkey actually. So the first thing I did was put the come along hitch on there. And then that donkey was, I mean, the perfect donkey the next three days. She just kept going over and over again. I can't believe he's doing as good as he has. And we flopped tarps all over him and dragged tarps, and he did awesome. That's great. So then, so what? what is the particular draw to the donkey versus the mule because i know that's something that we continue to talk about more and more and more folks are getting into donkeys just give me a basic functioning um you know <laughs> understanding of what is particularly drawing folks to donkeys right now um and why they're becoming more popular what is it that you're seeing that people are really starting to appreciate in them the donkey is very docile they just kind of stand there and let your pet and scratch on them. And they got them big old long beautiful ears. I seen donkeys that were, you know, about about 20 inches tall. Babies that were just born. Just really cute. And and they're little tiny. They're just cute and docile is the thing with them. And then when they go to, to make a move, these donkeys, it takes, it's rare that you'll have a donkey want to buck or want to shy off really bad. Usually they'll shy and just kind of look. We saw a good representation of that at the expo. Uh, we had a donkey and I went to drag the tarp and the donkey stood and looked and the mules said goodbye. And, 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 but they didn't go far. The mules, they just went just a short time. That donkey, that donkey even went to go up to look at it and sniff at that tarp, you know? So I think the best thing to answer for you is they're so docile, uh, they they like attention, and and that's what folks like a lot of. They they like to give them attention, lots of petting and scratching. Jason just chimed in. He goes, "Donkeys love people." Yeah, <laughs> he's he's right. They, uh, I, I'm going to tell you, fifty percent of the questions that I had was donkey related, easily, and there were several box stalls with some nice representations of mammoth jack standard jack minis and this sort of thing people were walking them down the road i'm telling you that minnesota expo it it looked like the 1800s people walking up and down and animals walking up and down and and wagons it was it was incredible you know jana says i had mules when i was younger now that i'm 60 a donkey is a better fit and jason uh, adds donkeys will come over to you even when they are eating they love people Yep. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. You'll have an odd donkey just like anything else. But for the most part, yeah, it's a, they're, they're very people oriented. They, they want to know what's going on with you and they come over and visit with you. And very few of them have a fear factor, uh, when it comes down to us, the predator. Um, uh, I've seen it with wild donkeys, uh, back in the mountains and, uh, they'll be just a few feet as you're riding by. And just watch you, you know. They know they can get away from you. Now, the jacks, we've had the jacks actually attack us, uh, and they can be quite vicious. But, yeah, donkey is just pretty much I love everybody. That's cool. Uh, Jana says, FYI, the Pinto Horse Association now has a long year division. Yes, yes. I found that out uh, by a lady who was in the Pinto uh, organization. What is that? And she's asked. Uh, well, pinto horses, painted horses. Ah. So horses with a lot of white and sometimes black and brown, sometimes white and brown. But the colors are just all over, you know. And they do have uh, a donkey division now. I'm going to start sending some articles to them and, uh, and, and start giving them some input with the mules and donkeys. Maybe some set up some uh, basic guidelines for their uh, shows. 
So is when it when we're looking at the when we're looking at the donkey, looking at the mule, looking at the horse, what which one does the which one does the donkey more align himself with? Is everything pretty much similar to the mule and the horse is different, or is there a lot of differences from the mule and it makes it look like, more like the horse? What where kind of is that line drawn? Now the donkey is is definitely more like the mule, and the the mule. You know, his characteristics are going to have the long ears and the head and the small feet. But we're breeding them so well now that if it wasn't for the ears, you'd swear up and down. Some of these uh, uh, mules that are bred well are actually quarter horses, but they're not. They just they just have a really good confirmation. And that that is the biggest thing is when it comes down to mules, we no longer are having really ugly mules like we used to have. So um, you said that about half the questions that you got from – I'm just curious about donkeys. It's something that we haven't talked a whole lot about, but it just came up here. So you said about half the questions uh, at the Minnesota Horse Expo had to do with donkeys. What are some of the starting points that – or some of these common questions that folks have? Um, you know, What are they coming up and asking? And it, Was there one common theme, or did it seem like the questions were all over the board? No, the common theme was – I don't lead him, he leads me. And everybody's using nylon halters, Dave, and leather halters because they figure it's the easiest on the animal. But all it's doing is creating uh, a, a job recognition for me because <laughs> them donkeys are dragging everybody, you know. Yeah. And and once people saw, and they also heard the lady as well, uh, what, what she went through and, and how well the donkey was, by the third day, the donkey was the star of the whole show, you know, but it was definitely that. And then the next part was uh, trimming of the feet and how important it was to have the feet balanced and then nutrition. And nutrition is a is a major problem with our equine world today. What's the summary of, for folks who who hear you mention mules can't stand prosperity over and over and over? Um, give us a summary of what that is, because there's probably a lot of folks who will hear you mention it, but haven't actually read the article. Give us just that summary and why it's important, um, you know, this this concept of the prosperity and why it's not great for them. Well, you know, the, the mules have that little tiny foot. A thousand pound horse would carry a, an ought shoe, for instance, maybe even a number one. But a thousand pound mule would carry maybe a, uh, a triple lot or a double lot. So their foot is really small. So you're putting the same amount of weight on a horse from a horse onto a donkey foot. And, and they just cannot handle it. So when it comes down to the, uh, the prosperity of it, we overfeed our mules, way overfeed them. And so with having all that feed and that body as big as it is, we're putting all that pressure on the foot. And that's when we start having rotating coffin bones. We have the uh, we talked about it earlier, where the 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 foot was starting to crystallize around the uh, around the hairline and uh, creating problems there with ring bone, uh, the laminitis, uh, lots of different things that we haven't completely put a, a thumb on, but pretty much got it figured that a lot of it's feed related. Uh, the that. All that carbohydrates and over uh, uh, the feed that we overfeed ends up going in the neck, ends up going to the top of the, dock of the tail and across the top of the ribs, and uh, they ended up end up having grass founder, and that's the downside of of us. We tend to want to give them just a little handful of grain. Well, that handful of grain can make them crazy looking for monsters, <clears throat> but that handful of grain can also go into the fat pockets with the sugars and carbohydrates and create massive problems uh, with grass founder. Um, so Carla just uh, chimed in and really timely question. Since we were talking about donkeys and, um, and uh, sh she says, do donkeys need their teeth floated just like mules? And then Jason chimed in, can you float the teeth when they still have some of their caps? So two teeth floating questions, one about donkeys and then, uh, floating them when they have some of their caps. Absolutely, it's imperative that you that you do your donkeys, 
and your young mules, they still, remember, they grind their feet. And, of course, right in behind the eye where we push the button and it pops up. That'll tell you if your TMJ's hanging up. But absolutely, you, I, I have my dentist look at our young mules from, from as young as two years old up, and we keep close eye on them. What about the, uh, what, what are the, um, some of their caps? What does that mean? What is he asking there? Caps, well, as they, as caps on them, and then they lose, they lose those teeth, and then the, then when that one pops out, then here comes the new growth, and <clears throat> by five to seven, usually by seven, they have all their teeth pretty solid, especially the front teeth. Yeah, uh, so Kevin then chimes in, so we kind of keep going back, uh, nutrition, feed, donkeys, can, can they thrive on nothing but grass or hay? Yes, absolutely. You know, they, you know, what, what do they have out there in the wild? Yeah. They've got leaves, they've got sticks, uh, whatever they can dig up. And when you're here in Arizona, you look around and say, well, gosh, what can these cows eat? But yet our cows are big and fluffy, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, they can, they can survive on grass hay. But remember folks, when you go to using them, that's when you're going to grain them with the whole oats. Don't just keep on feeding them grass. Because they need energy, and they'll get the energy from the whole oats. Uh, but also remember, too, that your grass feed doesn't always have the vitamins and minerals that you need. So that's pretty much all of the questions that I have for this week. So if anybody has any other questions, feel free to, to drop them in the comment section there. I do want to make note of a couple things. Um, over the last – so one, we've been selling a lot of come-along ropes. The more we've done yeah. these live streams, the mo more folks have started to believe that, hey, I need that type of communication control that comes with the come-along rope. But one of the things, Steve, and, and, and you're going you're gonna to know exactly what I'm talking about. One of the hang-ups is it's just a little bit tricky to get that come-along rope and learn how to install it for the first time. So I went ahead and I went through all of our YouTube videos and I found four different times uh, where you specifically are showing how to install a come along rope. And so I've put that but four times where they can see four different angles of you installing the come along rope because it is a little bit tricky. Are there any types of little tr tips or any types of little things that you know tend to help people or is it just, hey, keep watching and learn how to do it? Because it is a little bit of a... What did you do just right there? Yeah, well, I used to every year when Nick would come back down out of Canada who taught me how to use it, I'd say, Nick, I just can't get this come along rope thing squared away. And he'd show me again. Folks, you just have to keep doing it and doing it until you got it solid. Uh, we've, we're fortunate for you guys is you can now visually see it. Now, I think over in the come along section, when you buy the, the come along rope, we got a video right there too, don't we, Dave? Yeah, we do. And so uh, what I'm actually going to do, we're always trying to do better, uh, always trying to make things easier for folks. So what I'm going to do is anytime somebody purchases a come-along rope, I'm going to get an email just straight to send out to them to this particular article that I'm referencing. Um, because, yeah, it just does – it takes time, and hopefully seeing it from multiple angles will really help folks. So I'm going to try to get that set up there. Yeah, and, and it also helps them too – not just to install it, but it's really important how to use it. And and I've had a few people over the years say, I just wasn't quite getting it. But then they saw my videotape and saw how to use it, and it changed things. It's it's a great tool. It's an absolutely great tool. Uh, let's see here. We've got a few comments coming in. Jana says, uh, come along is essential, of course. One thing I picked up at the Hoosier Expo is not to hurry when putting it in place. Get that equine to turn their head towards you, lower their head, get them quiet, then place the come along. Sounds like someone was listening. Good for Jenna. Good for her. Yay, Jenna. Yay. Uh, David Pingali just uh, chimed in. He says, just lost the feed, but great show so far. Yeah, we're having some issues with the, uh, with the internet speed. It ha I test Steve's speed before we go live, and I test mine. But it's here at it's here at my office, so I'm going to look at trying to get some faster internet speeds because it's dropped out a couple times uh, so far today. So let's see here. Uh, Kevin Albright says, uh, "Oh, and David, thank you for the coffee. I've been enjoying that coffee every single morning since it arrived. You guys, it's a uh, I think it's coffeebydavid.com is I think where you go to 
purchase it. He sent me some of that zombie coffee that Steve was talking about on several uh, several broadcasts, and it is very tasty. I like it quite quite a bit. Yep. Um, so if we're taking a mule to camp and plan on riding two to three hours a day for a couple of days, does he need the oats or is hay going to be plenty with that type of a workload? Well, it kind of depends on how fat he is to start with. But if you're only talking three hours or so in a, uh, a day, maybe four, uh, probably not. But if he's kind of getting lethargic or you start seeing a drop weight, then go ahead and give him the whole oats and that'll help him out. It's, it's when you go out and pound uh, eight, ten hours a day and you're going up and down mountains and you do that for three to five days, you want to start throwing them whole oats to him. Very good. Uh, so uh, it's funny. Um, Eileen, she goes, no wonder you are extra chipper. It's the coffee, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've got – so just, we're not here to talk about me, but I, I'll just share real quick. I've got three kids. I have a six-year-old, I have a four-year-old, and I have a one-year-old. I used to not drink coffee ever, ever. And I think – with every child that's been born, I drink one extra cup of coffee a day. So I'm up to three <laughs> cups of coffee every day now. So I can't have any more kids or I'm going to be drinking nothing but coffee. It's it's incredible how much energy they take and how much energy I need. Yes. Uh, let's Lucky see here. Uh, okay, so Yolanda says, so what must I do when it comes out that Lucy must be put down, must I keep the mule there with her or must I keep her at the barn or just let her say goodbye after Lucy's put down? You know, that's actually something we haven't really talked about, Steve. Just the process of of having to make those decisions and having to go through that. I know you've had to do that. Do you have any advice on just going through that process? I've seen it a variety of ways, Dave. I've seen, I've seen it to where... I had two stall mates, Tom and Katie, a pair of Shire mules. Katie passed away, and Tom called for for a week. And I I often wish that she wasn't. She happened to be a couple miles away when it happened. Uh, I've seen it too to where we went ahead and put the animal down, and it just kind of laid down nice and quiet, and the the partner the stall partner kind of watched them you know being you know laying there and they're lifeless you can see them kind of paw and touch them it's it's almost kind of heartbreaking uh and then finally drag it off but i also can tell you uh, i know some people that got hurt really serious uh trying to take off with the other horse uh, uh, because the the other horse attacked them and hurt them pretty serious i you just have to make that decision. That's not an easy decision to do. Yeah, you know? no, sir. Maybe that's something that we can talk a little bit more on in a future broadcast is just kind of processing through that and, and even just the emotional side for for the for the person and just ways to kind of go through that because it, it, we don't talk about it, but when you have these animals for however many years that you have them, I think, Stacy, you had 28 years, right? Yeah. Yeah, yep. 28 years. Uh, it's, it's not just a, you know, here today, gone tomorrow type thing. There's... There's more to it than that. Um, so Ray Lockhart has a has a question here. He says, I've been looking at reviews on your saddles. Most were good, but one guy says the saddle pitched the rider forward. Any thoughts? I think I know what you're going to say, but but <laughs> yeah. go ahead. What what are your thoughts there? Okay. It, let's start first with confirmation of the mule. If, the, if you're feeling forward, that means the hip is higher than the wither. So you've got a downhill hip. That's one thing. The biggest thing is when people are sitting in the saddle, they don't have their their stirrups adjusted correctly. If you're feeling forward, you probably need to lower your stirrup, okay? And the last thing is, boy, and he'd be sitting straight up and down really right. You'd watch a guy sit in a padded seat, and you'd see him leaning forward. It's because that padded seat tends to get the uh the person leaning forward the guy now the girl is just the opposite uh <clears throat> they can usually set the hard seat or the soft seat but they usually prefer the soft seat with uh, because the little pin bones are hind in now i have some guys tell me because of course they don't ride a lot i have some guys tell me that they buy those sheep wool covers and put those on use those for a while 
the biggest problem comes with a guy is sweating. <laughs> you end up sweating and getting, you know, some pretty serious rashes there uh, with padded seats. But there again, a lot of guys say to me, they say, well, I ride a lot of hours. I need a padded seat. Well, I ride a lot of hours and I've never, I, I ride a padded seat only because it's my trail light saddle or, or my cowboy, I mean my trail light. Um, but I, I prefer a hard seat. Uh, I prefer my cowboy, uh, when it comes down to it, but, uh, long days in the saddle, that, that hard seat is, you can't beat it. But yeah, I'm that, riding off of my leg. That's what I was just about to say because you're riding off. What is it? Sixty percent off your legs and forty percent. Yes. What? Forty percent off your seat. Right. See, most guys you watch them, they tend to slouch down in the seat, and when they're slouching, they end up putting pressure at the wrong places, and then they end up kind of leaning forward to get away from the pressure. But the majority of people that send me pictures, and Dave, I tell everybody. I call everybody, even if they buy a come long rope, I always tell them, I, I want you 110% happy. If you got any unhappiness at all, call me and talk to me. It's amazing how somebody will go on there and, and do a complaint, but yet they won't call me and say, hey, Steve, give me help. I, and I'm willing to help, you know. Uh, send me some pictures and stuff. I'll be happy to help you out. But it's it's usually a a person setting in the saddle incorrect when it comes down to adjustment on the uh, uh, on the stirrups. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times when they're leaning forward, it's the confirmation of the mule. The hip's too high and the width is too low, and it's a downhill confirmation they're going to be forward. Yeah, it hey, is. Ray, don't worry about it. I'll take care of you, buddy. Yeah, so so the thing, the thing that you were just saying um, – it's not just you saying it. I see all of the pictures that come through and I see just about every single question that comes through. And, um, and this is too far forward. This is too far back. And folks, folks, after they make these adjustments, they're like, Oh, that's it. They're not doing that anymore. Or it's not doing that yeah. anymore. So it really is just minor adjustments. And, and that's just, that's just the way life is right. Bringing other people in, getting good feedback. So we've got a couple questions uh, that will, that will wrap up here. Soon as he as soon as he starts thinking about it, he's going to take you mule skiing. But as soon as he starts to bulk, bump, bump, bump. And always remember, don't bump straight on. Bump off to the left, bump off to the right. But if you bump straight on, you're using both brains. But if you bump and go to the left, you're using the left brain. Bump and go to the right, you're using the bump brain. But always try to catch it just as quickly as you can, Eileen. You'll do good. Yeah, and then um, let's see. Uh... Uh, Kevin Meredith, so this will be the uh, second to last question, uh, and I think this is pretty fun. Uh, how do you get mules used to dogs, uh, play with them at home, but he will freak out by them on the trail? How do you get them used to it on the trail? That's We're talking a flight and fright animal. There's no such thing as getting used to them. They're a predator, and you know, just, let me just give you this example, and I do this a lot, Dave. I'm sure you'll remember this. Mm -hmm. Here's my wife in the kitchen. She's in the kitchen, right where everything's feeling right, and she's cooking things like this. She knows I'm in the house, and all of a sudden I come around the corner, hey, honey, ah! you know, and, and any time you have something that all of a sudden, just look at the horror movies, you know, all of a sudden you want to get somebody to jump, all of a sudden spring up with something ugly, you know, uh, but they're a predator animal. Dogs are predators, just like a lion's and bears and this sort of thing. I can't tell you how many bears I've seen uh, out on the trails and at Yosemite and stuff. And you'd think those mules, as many as they've seen, that they would get used to them. They don't. That's why I say desensitizing don't work. It doesn't work, you know. What does work is one that respects the halter. It's just like in a trailer. You know, they think, oh, I'll use a nylon halter. All a nylon halter is going to do is brace. When you do the same thing with your with your mule and you're out on the trail, they're going to brace against it. So um, I'm putting the link right. We have a video just talking about the concept of desensitizing. I'm going to put that in the comment section. Last question that we have for today uh, comes from Jana. And uh, Jana says, will you have saddles to try at expos in the future? 
where we can uh, where can we sit in one? So we'll end on that. What do you have to say there, Steve? Well, I, I'm 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 kind of divided on whether to bring saddles and tack and stuff anymore. Uh, it does help to have one setting on one, but here's the problem: you're setting only on a saddle stand, and if you have a wide mule, that's going to be a different feel. If you've got a narrow mule, it's going to be a different feel. Dave, I've intentionally put a wide saddle stand out there and set a saddle in there, a narrow saddle stand. And I have people say, well, gosh, I kind of feel like I'm a little uncomfortable here or there, or uh, it's just too wide. And then I change stands, and it's amazing how they say, oh, that's just right. Well, what are you going to do if you've got too narrow of a mule, too wide of a mule? You know, the bars are the same. So setting in a saddle, the biggest problem that people have, Dave, when they sit in a saddle, they put their feet in the stirrups. Don't put your feet in the stirrups when you're going to climb in a saddle. Set in there natural like you would bareback. That way you can actually see if the saddle's fitting you with two fingers from the pummel to the to your leg. That's That's really important. But it's amazing how I've change these saddles and put them on different trees and everybody gives me a different thought. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It, the amount of people, I know that in the very early when you started the store, you know, years and years back, uh, Susan, your wife was skeptical. You know, nobody's going to buy a saddle if they can't sit in it first. And the reality is, is, um, it, it, and just, I'm just talking a little bit now, but also for you, Jana too. Um, the reality is that it, because it's made to fit the bone structure of the animal, it really has been amazing how many um, how many folks have purchased saddles online, gotten them, saddled up, called you for a few instructions on fitting, and they're off to the races. They're good to go. Um, yeah. I do think that you know one of the things is is picking that right size seat for the rider between the the thigh and the pummel. Uh, that's one of yeah. those deals where. I don't know if you can measure for that necessarily, or if you go, you know, try on a on a, a saddle that you can sit too closely and find out you're a 15 or a 16. Um, I think that's one thing, but it's been amazing how many folks have bought online and said it fit. We're good. It's it's awesome. It's yeah. everything I wanted. You know. Yeah. Usually, if folks give me a general idea, and I I can't get away with this talking to a lady, no matter how I say it. It's not our rump size. It's our thigh size. And so I start hearing about all the different thighs and thunder thighs and all this sort of thing. But anyway, <laughs> I get some unique comments. But it's amazing how I have people come and sit in the saddles or I watch people as I'm walking through the, the different expos, seeing people sitting in saddles. They got their feet in the stirrup and they're sitting in too big of a saddle. But they would know that if they didn't have their feet in the stirrup, where they could sit in that naturally. I've got a uh, I've got a video that I'm gonna or a link I'm gonna share in the comment section um, here in a second, uh, Jana. That is all about saddle fitting, saddle sizes, things like that. Uh, it might be some refresher information for you, but there might be some folks who have never seen it. It's it's really good. It's it's short. It's to the point. So Steve, that takes us uh, that takes us to the end. Uh, this was great. Again, folks, if you have any questions that we didn't get to or if anything comes up this week, um, feel free. Leave a comment on any of our Facebook posts. We'll wind up seeing them or you can send a, send a message to Steve, Steve at MuleRanch.com and we can add those. Um, if you have any questions on tack or any questions about videos or anything like that, always available for those things too. Steve, do you have anything you want to say before we, uh, before we call it a show? Got a couple of things coming up in uh, South Dakota. I got a big mule ride we're going to be doing we're going to be part of uh this uh camp up in uh up in south dakota is it's called the hay creek ranch uh you'll see, dave's going to put the information on the uh, on my website and get it on facebook and youtube and other places so that you can see it and uh also i think i found some products dave that's going to help the mules and donkeys when it comes down to flies. Nice. Uh, I've been on the search for this. And of course I've talked about WD 40, Yeah. but I met a lady that it's these hair grooming products are like her kids. She's got nine of them and it's really good stuff. And uh, I'll send you, I think I sent you a couple. Is that Madison McDonald's? 
anyway, we'll. Uh, I think I sent you the video of me and her talking. Is is it uh, Madison uh, Madison McDonald? No. Uh, what was her name? Might have been Madison McDonald. Uh, you're standing there with the video. She's got some spray bottles. Yes. Yeah. Let me see if I can bring. That, that is up Madison. Here. Yeah. Uh, well, name. there's a sign in the back. Uh, oh no, that's just one of the that's just one of the promo signs that she has. I got ah. it right here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I can't see what it's called. Espana products. Yes. Yeah. Espana. Yeah. E yeah. S P A N A products dot com. I'll put that in the links too. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm going to find out more about it. I've got some of my apprentices has some of the uh, sprays and stuff. These mules and donkeys get eat up during the uh, summertime and get allergic to flies and stuff. And I've been just searching at every expo I go to and, and talking to people, trying to find some way. And I could have it here in this Hispana program. It, uh, it, looks, it looks like it's really going to be good, but we'll visit about it uh, in the future, I'm sure. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to be back with you. And um, yeah, keep those questions coming in. And I'll just I'll end it with this. The the number one way uh, for you to kind of engage and show your support and appreciation here and, and to help us keep doing this is to continue to share this on your Facebook feed and invite your friends. Um, that that really is the heart behind what we're doing is to get all of this information in front of as many people as possible. Um, it's, it's just the idea of passing on everything that Steve has learned and getting it into the hands of as many people as possible. And, uh, and some of these old cowboys that Steve learned from, they didn't have the benefit of Facebook. They didn't have the benefit of YouTube. So he's been carrying a lot of it, uh, with a few other peers, but now it's to the point where we can get this out to the masses and we've gone international. So continue to invite your friends, continue to uh, make comments, to sh continue to share posts, on your feed and uh, and that'll give us all the fuel that we need to keep going sound good steve absolutely all right i'm going to go back to my plumbing we had some uh we come back we kind of had some water spraying all <laughs> over the place so that's not fun. yeah one of them things yeah. first thing this morning homo uh, hashtag life of a homeowner all right everyone we'll see you all right. bye, -bye. bye see y'all